Hey, Mr. Mayor, good to see you. Very well, thank you. Good evening. I'm John Martin, past president of the Inner Neighborhood Council of Durham. Thank you for joining the Inner Neighborhood Council and the League of Women Voters who are co-sponsoring this forum. Both the INC and the League are nonpartisan and do not endorse candidates or political parties. I would like to thank Durham's own television, DTV8, on Time Warner Cable for producing and broadcasting this event. Closed captioning is provided courtesy of the Durham Chamber of Commerce. At this time, please turn off your cell phones and refrain from taking pictures or videos of this forum. Please hold all applause until the end of the forum to save time for more questions. The participants in the forum tonight are candidates in the November 5th general election for Durham Mayor and City Council Ward 2 and Ward 3. While council members must reside in the ward from which they are elected, all Durham voters vote for candidates from all three wards. The Ward 1 candidate, Councilwoman Cora Cole McFadden, is running unopposed and therefore is not participating in tonight's forum. If she's here, I'd like to introduce her for the benefit of those watching. The candidates for mayor are, in the order in which they will appear on the ballot, William V. Bill Bell, Sylvester Williams. The candidates for Ward 2 are Omar Beasley, Eddie Davis. The candidates for Ward 3 are Pam Carricker and Don Moffat. All questions will be asked by the moderator and all candidates will answer the same question. Each candidate will be allowed one minute to answer each question and the buzzer will sound when the time has expired. The candidates are asked to observe the time limits. The first question will start with Mr. Bell, the second question will start with Mr. Williams, and we will continue to rotate the questions so that each candidate has the opportunity to answer first. If audience members have questions you wish to submit, Please see the representative over there on the other side of uh, the room, Dick Ford. So, first question for Mr. Bell. Mr. Bell, how are you different from your opponent? In other words, why should you, we vote for you rather than the other candidate? Well, I, I don't want to differentiate myself from my opponent. Uh, I would just say that uh, I think I have a track record as an elected official in Durham, having served almost 40 years, uh, 26 years on the Board of County Commissioners. 12 as the city of, as mayor of the city of Durham. I uh, served in leadership positions 12 years as chair of the Board of County Commissioners in Durham, on Durham Board of County Commissioners, and obviously as a leadership position uh, and mayor, as the mayor of Durham. Uh, I think my record speaks for itself. 
uh, enjoy the position. Uh, I work hard at it, and I certainly would support the appreciate the support of the voters as we go to the polls in November. Mr. Williams. Uh, first, I'd like to say that I, I am a pastor, and I do believe in my faith in the Lord Christ Jesus. Should be something that should guide us uh, if we are truly to our convictions. And one of the things I think that separates me uh, from the other candidate is that um, I have 30 years background as a financial analyst, and my experience as a financial analyst it forces me to stay abreast of the financial arena, of uh, the economy, and to know what's going on. Right currently in this country, a third of the jobs, uh, I mean, the jobs as far as jobs lost, being lost in this country are being lost in the areas that could be significantly affecting the city of Durham. And if we don't know what the financial arena is, we don't know how the economy is affecting us as a people, then we're going to be pretty much suffering going forward. And so my difference is my financial background, my faith in the Lord Jesus, and also my care, my concern for all people in the city of Durham and not just a special group. Mm -hmm. Mr. Beasley. Good evening. Um, the difference between... Uh, my opponent and myself, uh, well, I say let's start with our strengths. My opponent was an educator, longtime educator here in Durham, well respected and admired for, for uh, successful, ed, be, being a successful educator. Um, I have experience um, in workforce development, housing, as well as uh, public safety, and in parks and recreation. Um, those those uh, skills directly have something to do with uh, what city council has to do as a job. That's the difference between my ca uh, my opponent and myself. Mr. Davis. Well, first of all, I want to thank uh, the League of Women Voters and the Inland Neighborhood Council for sponsoring this event. I also want to thank the candidates for being here and um, giving of themselves and their time. And I also want to thank the uh, candidates who um, went through the primary, uh, particularly Franklin Haynes and Dale Mattioli, both of whom who have endorsed my candidacy. Um, I've spent 37 years in public education. Um, I worked 21 years at Hillside High School. I worked real hard with the student council. We worked on lots of different issues that um, focus in on um, issues of equity. I worked with a group of students that ended up lobbying the General Assembly and getting them to uh, make a small change in the United States Constitution. I also served on the State Board of Education uh, where I helped to develop a budget, the budget every year for the K-12 uh, education system in the state. Um, and Thank you. Ms. Carriker? I too appreciate the opportunity. I too appreciate the opportunity to come tonight and I have to say, for all the candidates that are here, just the willingness to serve is speaks highly of everyone that ran in the primary and is here on the podium with me tonight. I would have to say what separates or differentiate, differentiates us is I was born in Durham. I'm a third generation Durham girl, um, which gives me a unique perspective, I think, in the city. I served for 15 months as a county commissioner. I was appointed to take uh, Commissioner Heron's place when she stepped down. I have 20 years of service volunteering in this community in educational and civic and faith-based um, endeavors. I was a foster mom. I have 16 years experience as a mortgage processor. Mr. Moffitt. Thank you. Uh, um, like, uh, like everyone else up here, I want to echo the thanks for the people that organized tonight's event and the people who are running. Um, some of the things that people will want to know about me is that I have experience. I serve on council now and I'm running for another term. Along with that, I serve on 12 different boards and commissions, and I spent six years on the planning commission working on the issues that face Durham. Uh, my education is a bachelor's of architecture and a master's of business. Uh, in, in business, I ran a division of a major corporation, Whole Foods Market. I spent 18 years there building it from one store to 85. And now I'm helping build a community-owned grocery store with over 1,250 people who own it, who live in this community. I have a daughter in third grade at EK Poe, 
I work in community organizations, both on boards, people like Habitat for Humanity and the Polly Murray Place, and I support smart growth and equality for all families. Thank you. The next question uh, will begin with Mr. Williams. Mr. Williams, is there a serious problem in the Durham Police Department? If so, what is it, and what should the council do about it? I think that we should have a citizen's review board. Um, Derek Walker was a friend who was a friend of mine on Facebook, and he was one that, that I was corresponding with. And when I saw what happened downtown Durham, it really bothered me. I think there needs to be a citizen review board for any action, especially when there's deadly force being used, and the citizens have a greater say in the matter than what they currently have. There's a current citizen review board, but I think there need to be some where the citizens have greater uh, impacts as far as what's being said. And the reason why I say that is because, number one, what it does, it shows, okay, that there is no single group being singled out by a police department. And when the citizens of Durham do not have the do not feel safe with their own police department, then there is a problem. And I think by having a citizen review board, they have greater input as far as this goes on, then I think that also, too, that the citizens will feel better assured that they're getting the best protection they can possibly have. I also think, too, that uh, with uh, 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 chief of police, I think they need... Hey, thank you. Mr. Beasley? Yes, sir. Um, well, I'm not going to sit up here and say there's a serious issue with our police department here in Durham. Uh, the issues that we see here in Durham are pretty much nationwide. They're nationwide issues. Um, like Mr. Williams said, we would, I, I would definitely like to see a citizen review board, but I think it should be comprised of city workers from different departments that would uh, be able to come to um, some kind of uh, solutions or uh, recommendations for complaints that are lodged against different officers throughout the city. and then that can be presented to uh, the city manager or the chief or even to the council. Mr. Davis? Uh, yes, I think there is a problem, uh, but I think the biggest problem is the problem of explanation to the community. Uh, I was at a PAC meeting on uh, Saturday and there was an excellent uh, explanation given by one of the uh, top officials of the police department. And she explained uh, through lots of questions and answers about the recent shooting on the plaza. Um, and she answered questions about whether there should have been um, um, shots made by rubber bullets, or whether there should have been uh, shots to another part of the body rather than um, a shot that many people call shooting to kill. What she referred to it as was uh, shooting to neutralize the crisis. Uh, she did an excellent job, and I would hope that there could be more explanation like that uh, to the citizens of Durham so that they would understand the protocols that the police department use. Thank you. Ms. Carriker? I think overall um, we are not having a serious problem. There are some problems, however. Um, we have an excellent police force, and they care very much about the community. There are some statistics that are troubling as far as um, the percentage of African Americans that are being pulled over and searched as, as opposed to um, other parts of our community, and I think that needs to be addressed. But, and there have been some tragedies this summer um, as far as Mr. Walker's shooting and Mr. Oscampa, but all of those, that's under investigation. And I think a citizen's, um, review panel could be strengthened, but I think, again, communication is probably the first and best step. Thank you. Mr. Moffitt? Um, well, first, I, I want to agree with, um, with Ms. Carricker in that um, we have, I think, a lot of really fine people working for the department, but disparities do exist, at least um, statistically, both across the country and locally. And I think that that deserves consideration, and that consideration is underway now. Um, the, the SBI is investigating um, the department shooting, and the Human Relations Commission is working on the issue of disparities. Um, and so it's, it's inappropriate for me to actually take a stand one way or the other until they have a chance to do their work and then present it to council. Um, so thank you. Mr. Bell? I, I would say that um, with the organization, there are challenges, and certainly there are challenges with the 
uh, police department. Uh, I would also indicate in terms of um, evaluation of the police department, the police chief told us at our last city council meeting uh, that the police department was undergoing certification and was expected to receive the highest level of certification that are awarded to police departments. That's from an outside reviewing agency. In addition to that, obviously there, there are issues that have been raised by the community. I think the council has taken the appropriate step to step outside and to ask the human relations to look at those uh, concerns that have been raised. And I think at the appropriate time, once the human relations commission has made its report, then uh, I as a mayor and hopefully the council will be in a better position to evaluate uh, the results of that human relations commission study. Thank you. Next question, we will begin with Mr. Beasley. Also, this involves the police. Does the police department need to devote more resources and more officers to enforcement of traffic laws, including speeding, yielding to pedestrians, and sharing the road with bicyclists? If so, where will those resources and officers come from? Well, to answer your question is absolutely yes. Um, I had a problem in my neighborhood um, several several months ago uh, where uh, cars were passing a school bus and kids from my neighborhood were getting on a school bus and they were just flying by. And um, so we, we contacted some officers and they began to sit and watch that area. Um, so I think the resources are there because um, the, police, the police officers do um, have districts that they're supposed to uh, um, uh, survey, you know, so surveillance and everything. So when they, when they're there, they can easily in the morning time watch those areas where the school buses, the bike, the bicycle lanes, and make sure and assure that the uh, citizens of Durham are safe. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, I think that there should be much more discussion in the city of Durham about the. Um, roadways, uh, the traffic, uh, including the bicycles. Two terrible incidences have occurred recently um, with the deaths of um, bikers, and uh, we need to make sure that the citizens in, in Durham understand sharing the road. Um, the bicyclists are just like um, people operating other motor vehicles, and they have a right to that road, and I'm hoping that there can be much more dialogue about that. Uh, also, there should be much more discussion about traffic laws because we end up losing too many lives uh, through traffic accidents, uh, particularly with young people and sometimes with the abuse of alcohol and, and other kinds of is issues like that. Uh, um, Ms. Carricker? I think this is a problem in Durham. I think it's more than just a law enforcement issue, though. Um, we definitely need to emphasize that with our officers and make sure that they have the resources they need to enforce the laws that are out there. I think it's also a community um, endeavor that we need to, at the PAC meetings, that communities need to feel like they can call the police and address issues that are happening. I think we also need to talk about this though as a city as far as making sure that we have the bike lanes, that people understand the laws, and also another huge issue is pedestrian safety, that there are crosswalks and sidewalks because there are a lot of major thoroughfares that have no sidewalks whatsoever. Thank you. Mr. Moffat. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, one of the things that um, studies have shown is that people drive what the road allows rather than the posted speed limit. And there are resources there, um, they, like the police have come out, for example, and run operations on crosswalks. But the real issue, there are two actually major issues beyond policing, which is infrastructure. Um, sidewalks has been mentioned, but also um, making this, the roads so that they're less friendly to speeding, speed humps, road diets, traffic circles creating bike lanes. Uh, the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission is meeting right now upstairs. I'm on that commission, but I'm, I'm here. And this is something they work on, we work on, um, month in, month out. And the other thing is information, um, things like the, the fact that cars already yield to pedestrians <coughs> in crosswalks, getting that information out and helping people be more neighborly in the way that they share the road. Thank you. Mr. Bell. I, I would support the uh, comments that have been made by uh, Councilman Moffitt. Uh, additionally, in terms of resources, uh, you, you probably should know that our police uh, department is uh, staffed 
at the level that uh, they've, they've asked for in terms of sworn officers. It may be a question of how those officers are deployed, and certainly I, I would be open to listening to the community in terms of their suggestions as to what we might be doing to more efficiently and effectively deploy those officers to minimize the issues that have been raised. Mr. Williams? Uh, does uh, the police department need to devote more resources and more officers to enforcement of traffic laws, including speeding, yielding to pedestrians, and sharing the road with bicyclists? If so, where will those resources and officers come from? Uh, my response is that, you know, initially my thought was, are you serious? When we have young people being slain, being killed, when we have a police department that, whose salary does not match what salaries on our college campuses are, we're talking about bicycle lanes. Are, are we really being serious? Do we really understand the issues here in the city of Durham? Do we really understand what's, what's happening here in Durham? And I think oftentimes we don't understand what's going on. We don't know what the real problems are, and you can't just throw sweet water on and make and think it's going to be better. I think what we need to do, we need to address the issues for what they are. Resources to give our policemen better training as far as conflict resolution so when I have another incident, what happened on the plaza. We need to give them better salaries so they can have a vested interest here in the city of Durham and know that the people in Durham care for our police officers, but also that our police officers care for the citizens of Durham. This is where I think the resources should be going. This is what I think should be done. Thank you. Next question, we'll begin with Mr. Davis. Recently, there has been criticism of the Historic Preservation Commission. Are they doing something wrong? If so, what? And what would you propose that they do differently? Well, I don't think the Historic Preservation Commission is doing anything wrong. They are doing what we want them to do, and that is to talk about the uh, history, the legacy, the heritage of the buildings and the people of Durham. Uh, I know that there was a big issue about the, um, uh, the Liberty um, um, Warehouse. Uh, there were issues about um, the uh, other issues in terms of some of the buildings that have been proposed and approved. Uh, however, the, um, that commission, like all of the commissions, are advisory. Uh, they do the very best that they can to advocate the uh, positions that they see fit but that the ultimate decisions on those kinds of issues do come down to the uh, city council um, and in some cases the county commissioners. Uh, but I think that the uh, Preservation Commission is doing a good job and they should continue to stand up for the outstanding heritage of Durham. Ms. Thank you. Ms. Carricker? I would agree that they're doing a good job. There are a lot of beautiful buildings and we've already lost some beautiful buildings um, in our in the last recent years so I think it's good to advocate for that we also have to listen very carefully to neighborhoods and to individual homeowners or individual property owners and make sure that we're making the best decisions for everyone thank you mr. Moffat thank you the um, the historic preservation Commission a lot of the work that they do is to review what are called certificates of appropriateness um, these apply to structures that are in any local historic districts or more and more local historic districts and the Commission is dealing with an avalanche of certificates of appropriateness. Um, there's a lack of guidelines particularly for uh, what are called non-contributing structures which are structures within the districts but which are not actually considered historic themselves. And a uh, second problem they have is that not everybody who lives within all of these districts that are all over the city actually know that they're in such a district and um, so that there is also a catch-up work that goes on. Uh, so I think within the, the structure that they have, um, they're doing a good job. The fact that there is some uh, controversy from time to time indicates that they're probably doing something right and uh, it's something that we're looking at now to um, see if we can help them do a better job. Thank you. Mr. Bell? I, I wouldn't want to characterize uh, it, what they're doing as being wrong. Uh, I think there are certain areas that probably uh, they may be moving a bit beyond their bounds. Uh, I think certainly you have to balance the historic preservation of buildings uh, and restoration uh, with economic development and what the total impact is on our city. Uh, and there have been a few instances, in my opinion, where maybe they've gone a bit fur further than they should be in looking at historic 
issues and not balancing the economic uh, realities and the positives that some of the structures they are evaluating could have on this community. Thank you. Mr. Williams? I think there needs to be a greater buy-in from the community as a whole. Um, I was in a long conversation with a person who works with um, Strong Preservation Society here in Durham, and one of the things that this person was telling me is that there are a lot of things that's in Durham that they were not aware of. They did not know the history of Durham. They did not know a lot of the facts surrounding Durham. Me being a Durhamite, having lived here all of my life, I, I know some of the issues facing Durham. I know some of the historical places here in Durham. And here was a person that she was not aware of any of those things. So I think there need to be a, a greater buy-in from the community as a whole. I think they need a greater input uh, as far as understanding what should and should not be preserved. And I think that that any time you got a person who's been paying taxes for decades here in the city of Durham, I think you should really consider, you know, very hard you talk about displacing or removing those people for bigger or greater development, as they say. I mean, there is someone that has to be there to speak up for the small person. Thank, th thank you. Mr. Beasley? All right. Well, first and foremost, we're talking about a volunteer, a volunteer um, advisory commission. Um, and they're, they are designed to um, reserve the historic integrity of Durham, which is a great thing. I think a lot more people want to see that, um, see that um, held to in, here in Durham. Um, but the communities that are directly impacted by some of their decisions should be able to weigh in on those decisions before they're brought to council or even the county commissioners before a decision is rendered. Okay. Thank you. The next question will begin with um, Ms. Kerkerker. Um, the Periodic Rental Inspection Program, or PRIP, was established by the city to inspect rental housing in specific areas of the city which have a large number of substandard units. It has been suggested that the PRIP should be revised. Should the council revise it? If so, how and why? Well. I've been in the news a little bit about this recently. Um, I did say that I thought that the PRIP should be reviewed. Obviously, we want all housing to be up to, co up to code, and I totally support what the PRIP is trying to do. My concern is, is that we are at such a deficit with affordable housing right now that I want to be able to bring in landlords, developers, builders, plus the community and find out ways that we can make this so that it works and it will not discourage property owners from wanting to rent. Um, but I totally support the program, the, the especially making sure that everyone has safe and affordable housing. That is my passion, is making sure that everyone in Durham has safe and affordable housing. Thank you. Mr. Moffitt? Yes. Um, first, let me say it's the proactive rental inspection program, which is an important distinction because most of what the city, most of what the city does is complaint-driven, and um, that puts a tenant in, in the um, spot of having to actually complain about their landlord to the city. But because this is a proactive program, uh, we have people who go out and look at rental housing um, throughout in districts across the city in zones, 65% of those um, units have problems that need to be addressed. Things like uh, missing smoke detectors. These are basic safety items that absolutely should be addressed. The PRIP does not add a single regulation to a landlord. It simply makes sure that they're doing what they are um, already required to do. Um, it does help provide um, safe and decent affordable housing and I think that people that live no matter what their income is or what kind of housing they live in it needs to be safe and it needs to be decent. Thank you. Mr. Bell? I, I certainly support the PRIP. Uh, I think it's doing what it was set out to do. I think it's important to understand that when it was first established it was established almost citywide and through feedback from realtors, property owners, uh, the city council uh, decided to reduce the scope of the area that we'll be looking at so that we could be able to sort of, sort of determine how effective it's doing. And I, I think it's doing a good job. Obviously, something can always, it's open for review, for changes, but by and large, I think the goals that it's set out to do is meeting those goals, and I think it's doing it very effectively. Thank you. Mr. Williams? 
Uh, I work with the uh, South Side residents, and one of the things that would come up from time to time was that they would use code enforcement to put people out of their homes. And, and I think when we're looking at safe and affordable housing here in the city of Durham, why would someone who's living in, in dilapidated conditions anyway, would you use something such as code enforcement to have that person put out? when they can't afford to go anywhere else. And I think you know that we need to look at the whole program, look at everything that's involved in it to make sure that code enforcement is not being used to put people out of their homes. I mean, because where else will they go? Where else, where else can they go? And, and I think there are some that believe that, that this is intentional, that it's, code enforcement is selective, that they're not really trying to look at all the houses in Durham, but in certain areas that they want developers to come in to develop those areas. And this is what I would be opposed to. If, if you're going to use it, use it uh, uh, even-handedly across all this city of Durham and not be selective. Thank you. Mr. Beasley? Yeah, I support the efforts of the PRIC. Um, I support the efforts of bringing all rental homes up to code, particularly for their renters. Um, if there are code violations that need to be addressed and the program sees them and, and, and deems them need to be addressed, they need to be addressed. But like um, Mr. Williams said, uh, the violation should not put the renters out of their home. You know, you should, the, uh, the owners of the home should have time to address the issues, fix them up, and allow the, uh, the tenants to stay. Thank you. Mr. Davis? Well, I support the program and would like to make sure that we put a little more teeth into it, actually. I, I think that um, in many of these programs, they appear to be voluntary and there are some housing units uh, some renting rental units uh, where there needs to be some more enforcement uh, to, to deal with code uh, and also to deal with um, uh, making sure that the renter and the rentees uh, are doing the kinds of things that they need to do to protect the property. Um, there needs to be a balance. Uh, we know a lot of people who um, are renters who may not always do the um, kinds of things that they need to do to protect the property that people are renting to them. Thank you. Next question is related to both of the last two. Does Durham have a gentrification problem? If so, where is it a problem and how is it a problem? Well, gentrification, of course, is when people start moving in, uh, when people have been living in a community for a long time, and then other people see the property values there as being uh, something they can capitalize on, move in, fix up. Property taxes begin to rise and people can no longer afford to live there. And I think this does happen in areas across the city. Um, there are, um, there, uh, the Durham Community Land Trust is one organization that is working on solutions to that where people own the structures but they don't own the real estate itself underneath it so that, uh, and it's owned by a nonprofit so they're protected from the tax increases. Um, and, but they can still build wealth. And I think that's an important consideration. Um, probably places where this is going on, we see it in Cleveland Holloway right now. Um, you know, property values there have risen uh, substantially over the last few years. But that's going to be um, more and more communities uh, that are uh, adjacent to downtown. I think we'll see that kind of pressure, and it's something that deserves careful consideration. Thank you. Mr. Bell? I, I'm not sure that we have a gentrification problem as we define the gentrification. Uh, I think what we have is an, an opportunity to help revitalize some of the neighborhoods. Uh, the city has taken uh, the lead in some cases, the private sector has taken lead in other cases. Uh, by the same token, we're also mindful of the fact that uh, there's a need for affordable housing in this community. And I think the city has taken the appropriate steps. Uh, we're probably the only city in the state of North Carolina that has dedicated at least one cent of the property tax to affordable housing. In Durham, that means about $2.2 .2 million that will go towards affordable housing. But I, I wouldn't say we've got a problem. I think, I think what we have is a combination of uh, private sector coming in, the public sector coming in, and still being mindful of the fact that we've got to have housing for persons who can least afford. And that's where the city has stepped in with the affordable housing effort. Thank you. Mr. Williams? Uh, I attended a Durham Community on the Affairs of Black People meeting, and we had um, a, depart a Department of Transportation official come in. And one of the things she said that what they wanted to see done in Durham is the same thing they've done in Charlotte. Well, if anyone who's been a part of Charlotte and seen the transformation they've taken there, you realize that Charlotte's gone from being predominantly black downtown to almost predominantly white. 
they say well, the same thing done here in Durham. Is that by design? Or uh, we're saying that there are some people that are expendable that, that do not have a, a root here in Durham that should not live here in Durham? So I think that when you look at that and when you consider Southside once again, where I've heard reported to me, that uh, they were saying, okay, we'll give you $20,000, people living in Southside, and you buy one of those houses, they are building there in the Southside area. Well, these houses are $160,000. What is $20,000 going to do towards them making those payments to live in that area? Yes, they are being pushed out. And anyone have to say they're blind and they can't see if they can't see what's happening in the city of Durham. We know what's happening in the city of Durham. And this is why in every community I go into, I fight for the citizens of that community because I want them to realize and understand you have a vested interest in the city of Durham. No one should just be able to come in and push you out. Thank you. Mr. Beasley? Uh, yes, I, I feel that there is an issue of uh, gentrification going on here in Durham. Uh, my friends that uh, grew up and uh, family members stay over there in North, Northeast Central Durham, and uh, a lot of people are buying homes over there and fixing them up and people being moved out. Uh, you look at the, the uh, housing developments that we had here in Durham, uh, the Fayetteville Street, um, Fayetteville Street uh, housing projects. You, you look at Southside. Even though the this, this city has taken a lead of, of addressing that issue with putting affordable homes in the Southside project and um, Rolling Hills, but the, the perception is that it's gentrification going on. Perception is everything. Thank you. Mr. Davis? Well, I think, uh, as Omar said, uh, perception is um, in many ways um, what is reality for lots of people. I don't know that we are um, suffering from the development that we've had here in Durham, uh, particularly downtown. Uh, I think it's a good thing when people come in and they uh, revitalize uh, neighborhoods and they are able to um, uh, start and restore businesses. What I would like to see is for that model to be replicated in lots of the different communities in Durham. Uh, there ought to be ways that we can uh, look at um, the Federal Street Corridor, Old Haiti. Uh, we ought to be able to look at the West End and the East End and other parts of Durham to make sure that some of those businesses uh, are put together in a way that might be able to utilize the skills that come from North Carolina Central, from Duke University, and to do what people complain about being done in some places, they ought to be able to do that themselves. And I think that, that we can do that. Thank you. Ms. Carricker? I think we all want to see neighborhoods revitalized. I mean, that's a good thing. When people are moving in, when young families move in, and when people are fixing up their houses and cleaning up their yards, that's all a good thing. However, we, I think we are beginning to see a problem with gentrification as far as people not being able to afford the houses in the neighborhoods that they've grown up with. Because our home ownership is historically low, that's a problem. There are people that are renting, that have been renting for years and years, who are being pushed out of their houses. I've seen a study recently that says the shortage in Durham there, we need at least 450 houses affordable in a range below 150,000 to meet the need. We need 3,500 apartments in that range. And while I really appreciate that the city has the penny for housing tax, and I think that's a really good start, it's not something that the city is going to be able to accomplish by themselves, and it's a serious problem that we need to address. Thank you. Next question will begin with Mr. Bell. Uh, how will you weigh the rights and interests of developers and existing homeowners when considering infill development in established neighborhoods, especially those near downtown undergoing revitalization? I guess I refer back to the comments I made earlier. Uh, certainly, I, as the mayor of the city of Durham, and I think the council understands the need for affordable housing in this community. Uh, we also understand the need for the revitalization of certain neighborhoods. And uh, what, what I would see is, uh, depending on what is being proposed by a developer, and how does that fit into the overall plan that Durham has for providing more affordable housing, providing uh, neighborhoods that have mixed incomes? And I think an example of that, and don't say what, I'm not gonna say what we think, I'm gonna tell you what we're doing. I think a perfect example of that is what we did over in <coughs> Barnes Avenue on East Way, in East Way Village, uh, where we now have mixed income home ownership units, all driven by the city of Durham. I think you're going to see that in Southside, and you're seeing that in Rolling Hills, where we've got mixed income affordable housing, and I think it fits into the structure that we're trying to do in terms of revitalizing neighborhoods by the same token, mindful of the opportunities for people to own and also to rent. Thank you. Mr. Williams? Repeat the question, please. 
Yes. How will you weigh the rights and interests of developers and existing homeowners when considering infill development in established neighborhoods, especially those near downtown undergoing revitalization? Well, I'll tell you what my response was when I was speaking to the Kennington Heights uh, residents as far as uh, developers coming there and wanting their property. I see, and I, and I think that it's you know, shameful the way that sometimes developers come in uh, trying to offer the residents pennies on the dollars uh, for their homes. I think that, you know, if you're going to, if a house is tax value is at forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000, you're going to say to this person, I'm going to take your house and I want you to move someplace else. Well, give that person, especially the elderly person who doesn't have a mortgage, give them the money, the resources where they can go somewhere else and still be mortgage free. If it's under a $60,000 house or an $80,000, where the, the average values of homes in, in the city of Durham, then that's what they should get rather than giving an elderly person pennies on the dollar and ask them to go and start all over again with so little. And so, you know, I, I think, you know, that, that there could be a better, because we want development here in the city of Durham, but we also must consider the people who built Durham the ones who've been here for decades, paying the taxes in Durham. Thank you. Mr. Beasley? Yes. Um, well, with the developers that are coming in, you know, to do the infill development, we have to uh, make sure that we're not disturbing the integrity of the community that's already there. Um, I think that's important. But when we, when we, when we look at the new development that are, that's coming in, we have to uh, make sure that uh, it's, it's, it's a live and work uh, environment that the, everything that we're putting up is uh, accessible. It's, you, you want to you wanna have um, housing that's, that's close to, um, that's, that's close or that, that includes some commercial development. So um, you don't want to really destroy the integrity of certain communities, but you also want to make sure that you have places to work where people are putting new development in. Thank you. Mr. Davis? Uh, yes, I think the, the first thing that has to happen is that there needs to be a, a thorough set of dialogues that uh, occur in those communities. That there ought to be ways that people can recognize where we may be going, what might be the potential uh, for the development, and how can people who are there now, who've been there, who have roots there, uh, will be able to be able to to be sustained or if there are going to be ways for them to move into other communities. Um, I think that we, we really must be able to deal with the mixture of development in a way that people who have um, moderate incomes can s maintain the um, living ability that they have in those communities while looking at ways that the community at large might be improved. Thank you. Ms. Carricker? I don't think there's an easy answer to this. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to do it very carefully. Um, we're going to have to move slowly and make sure that we're taking care of everyone. Durham should be able to do this. I mean, our history is that we've always had different neighborhoods of different socioeconomic um, levels side by side. So I think our, our community is probably better equipped to do this than a lot of cities. However, as Durham becomes, because Durham is such a wonderful place and there are great things happening here, as people come in and as we do see these new developments closer into downtown, especially the high density ones, we have to watch very carefully that they remain mixed. If they become very popular, they may be kind of gentrified so that it becomes impossible for lower income people to move in, or it could be that, that people with higher incomes will avoid them and they'll just become projects. So we have to be very careful. Thank you. Mr. Moffat. Well, I heard the question as developers of redevelopment versus residents. And um, this comes into play with rezoning cases in particular. Uh, I spent six years on the planning commission. I chaired it for three. I actually heard hundreds of cases. And the issue is the same, whether it's near downtown or it's in the suburbs. It's in most decisions, it's a balance of the needs of the whole. Um, it's balancing the needs, uh, things like making make sure the community is livable, it's walkable, that, um, and that we also are expanding our tax base because that impacts everybody in the city. And we're using principles of smart growth. Each case is unique, and that's part of the work of city council. It's work I'm doing now, and it's work I look forward to continuing. Thank you. Uh, next, next question will begin with Mr. Williams. 
Recently, the Planning Commission voted not to rezone land for an office building, and then the City Council voted unanimously to reverse that decision. Is there a problem with the Planning Commission? Some would say there is. Um, you know, I think that, that with the Planning Commission, you know, it's the people that are on there, I mean, you, you have to say that, okay, that they're concerned for the citizens of Durham. And, Anyone who wants to take the time to do what they do, you have to, you know, understand where they're coming from. But also understand to the city council, you have to ask the city council, wh where are your vested interests? What are your reasoning for overturning what what recommendations have been brought to you? And and I know I throw this out. I know that there was um, an issue that came up with same-sex marriage here in the city of Durham. The city council voted to say we're not going to have any discussion from in the citizens of Durham. We're going to vote 7 to 0 without any input from the citizens. How can you have a city council that represents the citizens when they don't want to listen to what input from the citizens and what they're saying? So I think that, that you know that we should listen to them, that we should have greater input from our citizens, and we shouldn't be so, take such a capital attitude towards any recommendations that are being made. Thank you. Mr. Beasley? Yes, sir. Um, once again, like I said earlier, the planning, the planning commission is, uh, it is a volunteer advisory board. Um, although they, they thoroughly uh, review every, every um, proposal that comes before them, but what they do is recommend to the council what should be done. Uh, I'm sure that the council uh, took, in co took seriously into consideration what they recommended, but um, they probably saw a better um, a better benefit in um, approving that that plan than what they recommended. So um, I believe the council um, did their homework as well, and um, I, I would hope made a great decision. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, yes, uh, like the Historic Preservation uh, Commission that you talked about earlier, the Planning Commission, even though it, it does a great deal of work and um, deals with a lot of so-called in the weeds kinds of discussions, um, the council it ultimately makes the decision and in its counterpart, the county commissioners, uh, they make the decisions ultimately because they are the elected body for the county and the city. Um, the planning commission is a much larger group, so the ideas uh, may be more diverse, um, but I think we respect the work that the planning commission goes forth, uh, puts forth, and they, they do good work, and they make good recommendations, but the ultimate decision comes down to the city council and all the county commissioners. Thank you. Ms. Character? I don't believe that there's a problem with the planning commission, no. Um, in our recent history, we've had some situations where there's been sort of a little bit of an adversarial um, situation between the city and the county. Um, as far as the leaders are concerned. This is unfortunate, and I think we really need people that will work together. Since I've had the experience as a county commissioner, and I came on, I was appointed to serve as a county commissioner during a very contentious time, and I was able to have a very co cordial relationship and a good working relationship with all of the people that I was serving with. I've also had a lot of experience, six years with the C Citizens Capital Improvement Panel with the city. So I would work really hard to build the relationship so that we're able to work together and make decisions that are good for everyone. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Moffitt. Well, actually, the, the chair of the Planning Commission is doing a great job, and there is no dissension, really, between county and city appointees to the Planning Commission. Uh, they work well together now. Mr. Davis is correct in that the decisions, almost all the decisions of the Planning Commission are advisory. One of the things that I experienced when I was on the Planning Commission is that frequently the case when it arrived at the City Council was different than the case when it left the commit Planning Commission because developers are revising their proposals, they're making additional proffers, and um, the Council listens very carefully to the recommendations of the Planning Commission. Uh, in the end, uh, the buck does stop with the council to make sure that it's livable, it's walkable, that it's helping build the tax base, and that it's um, appropriate for the fabric of the city. So uh, I, it's not surprising that from time to time there's a disagreement. Uh, it doesn't mean that there's something wrong. Thank you. 
Mr. Bell? I, I don't think there's anything wrong with the Planning Commission. I think we've got a system in place where we've got checks and balances. The Planning Commission does its job. Ultimately, the City Council is responsible for the final decision unless it goes to the County. The County Commission is responsible for that. So I, I don't think there's a problem with it. I, I just want to reemphasize again that what, what the questions that we, we're being asked. 10, 15 years ago, nobody wanted to come to Durham. <laughs> now we're talking about what's happening in downtown Durham. How do we deal with infield development? 10, 15 years ago, no one was talking about revitalizing Northeast Central Durham, South Side community. And I would say, and, and all of those projects, no homeowner was forced to leave. In Rolling Hills, no one's asked to leave. Uh, it was a willing buyer, willing to sell, the same thing on Barnes Avenue. So I, I don't see where homeowners are being forced out of the areas where are being redeveloped. Kennedy Heights, the people were begging to be bought out. So uh, I, I just differ with some of the comments that have been made relative to people being forced out of their houses and uh, the whole issue of gentrification having that type of an impact. Uh, I would say that we understand that and we're gonna have a vision planning commission looking at downtown Durham. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Next question will begin with Mr. Beasley. Recently, the county commissioners voted to cut nearly $85,000 from the city county planning department budget in retaliation for the city council cutting a similar amount of money from another program. Will this be a problem for the planning department? What, if anything, should the council do about it? Well, um, I, I'm a bail bondsman. A lot of people know that. And the, the monies that the city council cut, cut from were uh, the warrant control system. I thought it was a bad decision um, because the workload that they had took on, it reduced the workload of our officers. Um, so I thought it was it was a, a bad decision to remove that those funds from the from the um, from the budget of war control. Um, as far as uh, the money for uh, the planning department, um, I'm, I'm hoping that that they can come to an agreement where uh, they can put back the money in in the uh, war control system, and this the county would in turn do the same for the planning the planning department's budget. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Well, with elect officials um, uh, who have authority and uh, those that authority is vested in them um, by the citizens, um, sometimes there is a discussion between the city and the county officials as to who has the most authority. Uh, and these kind of contests uh, go on and you read about them from time to time. I'm, I think it's unfortunate though when we get to a point where there can be punishment or there can be retaliation given uh, because both of those programs are very much needed. Uh, this if city county planning department needs the money to do the kind of work that, that needs to be done for the long-term future of Durham. Uh, and the warrants need to be served uh, by the sheriffs, uh, sheriff deputies and others along the way, uh, as well as the police department. So we, we need to make sure that the county commissioners and the city council uh, are able to iron out those differences. And if I get elected to the city council, I will be one that will talk about the conciliat conciliatory uh, responses that ought to be made from both of those bodies. Thank you. Ms. Carricker. Well, this was exactly what I was referring to in the last question. Um, I think both issues were not exactly clear cut. I understand why the city voted to reduce the warrant program. I'm not sure I agree with it, but I do see that, see why they did it. And as far as the county is concerned, I also understand why they did what they did. Um, the planning department has, if you compare it to comparable cities surrounding us, a very large budget. And I think it, that they could definitely prioritize to make sure that the things that we needed to the study, because I think it was about transit and affordable housing, to make sure that that is a priority for the planning department. So again, I say that I'm the kind of person, I want to talk about it, I want to be able to compromise it. I don't want to have it be a adversarial situation. Thank you. Mr. Moffitt. Um, I, I want to remind uh, folks that we, we first got into this when we were trying to close a budget hole and the proposal was to increase bus fares. Um, I met with the sheriff's office. I met with the Durham Police Department. Um, I met with the, 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 several of the command structure, including the corporal of the warrant squad. And we have a warrant control office at the city. And what our Durham Police Department said was, this does not have an impact, except for one thing. 
printing out the warrants. They had to get a printer. Um, it was the right decision, but I understand the county commissioners being upset because this was made without notice to them while we were trying to balance the budget. It's unfortunate that it's become a, a matter of retaliation. I think there are a lot of financial issues that cross over between the county and the city, and um, the GREAT program is one example. And we need to talk about all these issues together, not one at a time and not tit for tat. Um, uh, the Planning Commission has two, I mean, excuse me, the planning staff has two separate functions. Thank you. Mr. Bell? I, I, I can't add much more to what uh, Councilman Moffitt has said. Uh, I, I would say that uh, if it appears to be a problem with the planning commission, being a, the planning department being able to do its job, then I'm willing to support adding additional funds if, that, if that's what it takes. Uh, the county commissioners have freed up some dollars since they aren't putting money into the planning staff now, they can use those dollars to further support the warrant program if that's what they choose to do. But uh, I haven't had that discussion yet as a council, nor with the manager, but at the appropriate time, if it feels to be a problem, then I would be willing to add additional resources to help supplement the planning staff. Thank you. Mr. Williams? I think that's one of the things that I, that I would bring to the Office of Mayor. <clears throat> one thing, um, for those who know me, for those that will get to know me, one thing we know that, that I'm a person who loves to bring people together. There should not be an adversarial relationship going on when you're you impacting the lives of people. You should learn how to come together and say well, what's best for the city of Durham rather than what's best for my office or where I am. And, and that's one thing that I would bring because that's, that's what my whole life about is as a pastor, as a leader in the community, bringing opposing parties together and being able to reason together. And that's one of the things, you know, one of the things, characteristics and traits that I would bring to the office of mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next question will begin with Mr. Davis. The council voted recently to fund trash collection through a user fee rather than a property tax increase. How should the council decide which source of funds to use for particular purposes? Well, I think there needs to be uh, lots, of, lots of discussion, but I, I was particularly opposed to the user fee. Um, I think there was a combination between the um, need for material, uh, money for the solid waste department as well as their, the bus fares. Um, and um, I just think that, that those kinds of things should be utilized through the normal budget process and that would be better off if indeed we did not have user fees, uh, particularly user fees that would be regressive, um, that they are to be funded through the normal taxation process that we have. Thank you. Ms. Character. I pretty much agree with Mr. Davis on that. Um, I think there are definitely services that the city offers that fees are make perfect sense and should be utilized but most people consider trash a core service of a, of a municipal government so i wasn't particularly happy that we were going to charge a fee however i do have to say i understand that when you compare our fees to most cities comparable cities that it's much lower but as mr davis said it it doesn't seem exactly fair to people who are um, lower income that they have to pay the exact same thing that um, people who are in a much higher income range would pay. Thank you. Mr. Moffat. The question is always who pays and who benefits. Uh, again, we were trying to close a budget hole and uh, we had different tools we could have used. Um, we could have raised um, property taxes across the board. Um, that didn't seem particularly fair either. The use of these funds is to pay a, um, a portion of the solid waste capital cost. We looked at um, our, our sister cities across North Carolina that have similar um, sale, uh, excuse me, yeah, sales taxes as well as property taxes, and the solid waste fees run as high as $18 a month. So this is a very much smaller portion of that. Um, it does not have an impact on all citizens. For example, rental uh, par uh, apartment renters who would uh, eventually pay property tax increases, don't have to pay for this because the trash isn't hauled by the city. Um, the city does a great job with solid waste, and um, this, again, this is just to pay a small part of the costs attached to that. So uh, in any fee we have to look at, and that includes bus fares, who pays and who benefits. And 
Thank you. Mr. Bell? Well, I think Council Moffitt has explained a lot. Um, we, 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 we went through a budget process. Uh, it was at least the opinion of the majority of the council that we did not want to raise property taxes. It was also a question of whether or not we wanted to raise bus fees. And as we went through the, pro through, through the process of public hearings, uh, the biggest outcry that we heard from the public was not to increase bus fees. So what we did is basically shift dollars that normally would have been going to the uh, solid waste. We shifted that to allow us to minim not have to raise, increase the bus fees for, for data b bus drivers. By the same token, we were able to not increase property taxes, and we were able to uh, impose a, a user fee, which is not unusual for cities like Durham throughout this region. And it's been indicated we probably have the smallest user fee for that service that we provide. Plus, the law provides us to do that because it's an enterprise system. And with enterprise systems, you use user fees to pay for an enterprise. And that is what we did. Thank you. Mr. Williams? Can we be honest with our citizens? A user fee, it's a tax. When you look at the budget for the next five years for the city of Durham, it is a projected deficit for each year for the next five years. How do they propose to make up that deficit? We're one time touting, be not just about our triple A rating, talking about what a good rating we have. And you're constantly raising fees on people or tax that can least afford it. What kind of city are we becoming? We've got to look at those who are, are, are the most impacted by these user fees and say, well, why are we doing this? Why are we doing it? Is there a better way? And right now, with, with the deficits that we have projected going forward for the next, for the next few, year, few years, how do we address those kind of things? That's why you need someone with a financial background, someone who understands the financial markets, someone who understands what a AAA rating truly is and what it is not. Someone who truly... Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, Mr. Beasley? Yes, sir. Um, like uh, Ms. Ms. Carricker said, um, uh, waste collection is, is one of our core services. Um, if I had to make a choice, and, and I'm, I'm pretty sure this is what our city council had done at the time, um, to raise our property tax or sales tax rates, which uh, are w one of the highest in the states, you, 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 you go ahead and put on that, that user fee. Uh, it's a small fee, um, and the waste collection department, they, 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 they benefit, and um, the entire, the entire uh, citizenry of Durham doesn't have to suffer because of the shortfall in the budget. Thank you. Next question, we'll begin with Ms. Carricker. Um, do you support consolidation of the city and county governments? Why or why not? Well, yes, but with a caveat. I don't think this is something that we can do very quickly. I think it's something that we should start investigating and moving towards. We're already sharing um, some services as far as planning and tax collection. I think we should continue to look for ways that we can consolidate and work together. And I'm not sure that honestly that we'll ever be able to totally consolidate and merge the city and county, but I think there's a lot of ways that we can work together more closely and consolidate services, and it would be a benefit to citizens of the city and the county. Thank you. Mr. Moffitt? Well, sure, I, I would support it, but we shouldn't expect financial benefits from it. Studies have shown over and over again that ultimately the county and the city, where they can work together, as Ms. Carricker said, they are working together. But for the most part, they're providing very different services, social services by the county, for example, streets and uh, solid waste by the city. And um, so th there's not a huge financial savings here. Efforts have been made several times over the, over the last 50 or 60 years, the last one in 2000, and tremendous amount of energy expended all comes to naught. So I think we need to be careful about where we're spending a lot of time and energy and make sure that we're really serious about it if we move forward again. Um, that I do think that we need to have a separate taxing district for the urban area so that the entire county doesn't wind up paying the same tax where some people have access to parks and recreation, for example, and some don't. But um, one big benefit is people understand where their services are coming from. Thank you. Mr. Bell? I, I've been down that road. 
uh, I was chairman of the county commissions when we merged many departments that emerged now. Uh, the city, this county, had just recently in the past year asked the two managers to come back with recommendations as to which departments could be consolidated or work together. They were not able to come up with any. Uh, in my sense, that merger takes place generally when you have a crisis. Uh, we don't have a crisis of management of either the two cities. Uh, merger is going to require the support of the people. And if it, if it happens, it's going to happen, in my opinion, from bottom up, not from top down, uh, through a referendum. And if there is sufficient uh, support bottom up to have a referendum on, on merger, I would be willing to look at it. But I, I'm not in a position where I would be willing to uh, expend energy trying to merge two county, a city and county where there really is no issue. And the financial savings has all been alluded to. There's going to be very little financial savings for merger. If there's any city, county that's a candidate for merger, it is in Durham because we're the only county that has one municipality. Thank you. Mr. Williams? Uh, I agree with Mayor Bell as far as support um, from the people and possibly having a referendum uh, to make that kind of decision. And I also uh, think, too, that uh, I think that there's something that eventually will happen. When you start looking at the being fiscally responsible, when you start looking at the city and the county and the duplication of services, then you realize that, you know, that eventually it's going to happen. But I, I would not want to be one of the ones pushing that button, saying that it would happen under my watch. Thank you. Mr. Beasley? Yes, sir. Um, I, I, would, I would support um, the, uh, com the combining of uh, governments. Um, you know, with, with, uh, with the independent, um, independent uh, study, you know, they said there's been study to show, to show if uh, there would be any savings done by the, by the city government and by the county government, and they, they showed they have, that there isn't going to be. I would like to see an independent study to sh that, would, that would give us that answer. Because um, to me, in, in working in, in, law, in law enforcement as a bail bondsman, uh, you see the police department, the sheriff's department, there's a lack of communication there. That's one department that I know would, that would benefit directly from uh, the combining of governments. Um, so, like I said, with the with the good feasibility of, from an independent from an independent contractor, I would like to see if that's um, something that would be good for Durham. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Mr. Davis. Well, if I get elected to this position in Ward Two of the City Council, I will be following in the footsteps of Howard Clement, who has been one of the strongest advocates for city county merger over the years. Uh, so. I, I think that it would be a good thing for, to happen, not only because Howard has advocated it, uh, because it could uh, avoid some of the duplications of services that we have. And also, perhaps it wouldn't be in the issue of trying to decide on warrants versus planning department. Uh, there could be lots of things that we could, be, could be done. However, with that said, um, I know that it would have to come through a voter referendum, and frankly, I don't have much confidence that that would be approved. Thank you. I'm going to turn to some questions um, that have come directly from uh, the audience, and I'll read them as I, as I have received them. Uh, we'll start uh, with Mr. Moffat, um, and this is obviously a perennial question. With the widespread crime we have here in our area, what strategic plan would you put in place to address or to try to curb this serious issue? This, this is the other side of the coin of what we talked about earlier. And um, I, the police department, I go to Comstat meetings. Uh, the police department holds Comstat uh, once a month. They bring in all the department commanders, all the district commanders. They actually put up photographs of the people they're looking for. They talk about what's going on. They talk about the initiatives. They're very focused on crime in Durham. The result is, is that crime in 2012, we don't have complete statistics yet for this year, but in 2012, they were 8% lower than the prior year, which was 6% lower than the year before that. Um, the, now, what's different is, is that we no longer give up on Northeast Central Durham. It used to be that we had, uh, we have more crime in my neighborhood, for example, because we're now actively policing in Northeast Central Durham. And we're no longer like saying it's okay as long as you do it in one place, as long as you don't go to another. So we're seeing more crime across the city, but less crime yeah, and we're seeing more crime in some parts of the city, but less crime overall. Thank you. Mr. Bell? 
I, I don't have a magic solution for uh, reducing overall crime in our community. Uh, I know it's going to continue to take the support of the community to do that. And we, we're trying to reach out to the community as much as we can. Law enforcement isn't going to solve this problem by itself. I think we've shown that we can make strides in Northeast Central Durham by the co concentrated effort that we've put there. Uh, at the last meeting, uh, the police chief didn't feel that because crime was going down in Northeast Central Durham, it was being pushed into other parts of the neighborhood. But of course, that's what the police department was saying. Uh, I just think it's going to take a concerted effort, a continued uh, vigilance on the part of the community as well as the police and trying to uh, reduce the overall crime in our community. And it is going in the right direction. It isn't going fast enough, but it's moving in the right direction in terms of uh, crime being reduced in our community. Thank you. Mr. Williams? Uh, to address the crime problem in Durham, we've got to look at our school systems. Uh, there are studies that say that 75% of crimes committed in this country are committed by high school dropouts. There are also studies that say that I discovered while my child was in elementary school was that by the time a child reaches the fourth grade, they have decided whether the child is going to finish or drop out of school by, based on his interest in school at that level. And that child drops out, they're more than likely that child be involved with crime. So we got to look at our school system, do what things we can do to support our school systems. And what I'll be willing to do as mayor is go into the school system to encourage our young people, let them know that there is a place for them because as a pastor and talking to a lot of the young people in the community, I know some of the issues and challenges they face. And if there's not someone there to encourage them to get them to get engaged in school, then you're, not, you're going to continue to have this same crime problem. But when you realize that there are things that can be done in, at an early age to intervene in these people's lives, then you're going to find out that you can, find, you can actually affect the crime problem that we have here in the city of Durham. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Beasley? Yes, sir. Um, I, I do a lot in the community with our youth. Um, I'm a youth mentor and volunteer track and field coach. Um, I feel the way we address this issue is uh, being proactive. We have to um, identify nonprofit agencies that do a good job at keeping our kids busy off the street um, and properly fund them. Uh, you know, what, what we got to do is take the resources, the kids, away from the gangs. Once we do that, you know, you have these kids... Um, engage, you, you, the light bulb comes on, and you keep them busy. And that's how we, we curb the crime. And the second thing is workforce development. Those that are unemployed, you got to train them, find, you know, uh, put trades back in the schools. We train these kids, give them skills, and you employ them, and that will take care of our crime issue. Thank you. Mr. Davis. Well, I'm, I was pleased to be able to see the statistics that indicated that crime is going down, in, in particularly in, in areas uh, of Durham that uh, most often has, have been uh, viewed as the most crime prone. Uh, however, we need to make sure that we are focusing in on the most immediate and the most damaging piece of crime, and that is the homicides that we've had. Um, and even though Durham statistically is not as bad as some other places, one loss of life is more than we should ever allow to take place in this community. This community has so many resources and so many smart people, people who can contribute to a solution that, to deal with the root causes of what brings children to the, uh, brings children and adults uh, to a point where they feel that they can resolve conflicts by shooting and killing each other. We've got to make a community effort to try to go across uh, Durham to solve this problem. Thank you. Ms. Carriker? I would agree with pretty much everything that's said. Um, one thing that I would <clears throat> also talk about, I think it's very important that jobs are a part of this, that there are um, legitimate good jobs that, that that young people can attain after graduation uh, if they're not college bound, that there's legitimate internships and vocational training that will give them jobs that will earn them a living. I think that's very important. I think mentoring, as Mr. Beasley said, is very important. That we are all stepping in and all working to reach young people and to give them perhaps the grandparents or the aunts and uncles that they don't have that that as families sort of fl fly apart and they don't have the family relationships that we had in the past that that we're there as a community for them I th thank you 
Um, and then another uh, question from the audience. A number of the questions from the audience do concern the police department. We have had, of course, a couple questions already about the police. Um, but I, I, will, I will ask this one, um, and I'll start with Mr. Bell. Um, how would you prevent the police from profiling? Again, and I, I'm not trying to evade the question. Uh, that was one of the challenges, one of the issues that was raised uh, at the City Council. Uh, that was one of the issues that we posed with the Human Relations Commission. And I, I really don't want to jump into that. I, I, I want to wait until they've had an opportunity to, to fully discuss it and come back with a recommendation before I, I try to deal with that problem. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Mr. Williams? Um, first of all, I, I don't think that uh, our city officials should talk down to the citizens of Durham when they're trying to get an answer to problems that concern them. I think that we are here to serve the citizens of Durham. Um, one thing that I would say that what I think need to be done is that there need to be sensitivity training because we find that there are different cultures here in the city of Durham. And until you learn how to address those cultures, realize that just because a person dresses a certain way or look a certain way does not necessarily mean that person is a threat to anyone. And so one thing that I would, I would do or recommend uh, is trying to avoid profiling is that there be sensitivity training for all on the police staff. Thank you. Mr. Beasley? Yes, sir. Um, well, I, I, I've been a victim of uh, racial profiling many times here in Durham and uh, other places while visiting. Um, so it's, it, it's a problem here, but it's a problem across the country, like I stated earlier. Um, but like Mr. Williams said, I think uh, there's other countries, I mean, there's other cities throughout the state, I mean, throughout the country that have um, taken on racial sensitivity training with their police departments. And I, you know, looking at the numbers that we've had um, that were shown uh, recently in the paper, I think that wouldn't be a bad idea for our uh, department to um, consider. Thank you. Mr. Davis? Well, I don't know what the department does, and this goes back to the issue of how well the department, the police department, um, speaks to the people, the citizens of Durham. Uh, I can't believe that the Durham Police Department does not have some kind of racial sensitivity or sensitivity training um, in its uh, toolkit of things that may be going on. But if it is happening, they need to share that with the citizens so that people won't bring this complaint. Um, there ought to be some ways that we can show that uh, in addition to the statistics that talk about the, uh, what appears to be profiling, uh, there ought to be ways that the department can say to the citizens, here's what we do, here's why we do it, here's what we are not trying to do so that we can indeed um, get the facts and not just deal with the emotions of this issue. Thank you. Ms. Character. Uh, one way we can work on this, it goes back to a previous issue, is affordable housing. We need housing in Durham so that policemen, teachers, and even pastors can afford to live in the city. Um, that's a big problem. When the police force doesn't really feel part of the community, I think that makes it more difficult for them to feel um, maybe the empathy that they would need for the citizens. Um, so that's one issue. Racial profiling is a fact. It's not just in Durham. It's nationwide. Um, I think we need to look at our drug enforcement priorities. We're not going to be able to change the laws. That's not city council's job. But maybe we talk to the police that if there's ways that we can end the school to prison pipeline and save young people from um, you know, being arrested and getting records, which makes their future very difficult. Thank you. M Mr. Moffat? Well, I think that Ms. Carricker has made a couple of good points there. Um, um, one of the things, it's not unique to Durham. Other communities um, are, have worked on this, and um, there are solutions in place that um, we need to carefully consider. Now, FADE is an organization that's been working on this, and they've made recommendations, including, for example, working with the Racial Equity Institute. Um, and um, as I said, that deserves consideration. The Human Relations Commission, I'm the liaison to that uh, board, is working on this issue now. And um, so I think all of this comes into play when we start looking at the disparities in the way that um, traffic stops are made, disparities in, in um, the self-identified drug use versus 
the number of arrests and incarcerations that occur. Um, and I think that um, the more that we, I, one of the things I want to do is I want, one of the things I'm working on now is how to get affordable housing across the city so that it's not all clustered together so that um, we're all in community. Thank you. Um, another question from, from the audience, um, and we'll begin this one with Mr. Mr. Williams. Uh, is it possible to reduce the property tax? Yes, it's possible to reduce the property tax. Um, you know, th there are some zoning laws that we have in place that could be changed that would attract businesses here. I mean, you know, the skyline of Durham, I think that is great, you know, but there is no reason why we can't build taller buildings in Durham. We've had corporation, one corporation at least anyway, that decided not to locate in Durham because of the, there was not enough space to hold the, 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 uh, uh, the, the company employees. And what I'm saying is that if we look at the zoning laws, and then we could also look, if you if change the zoning laws the way things are currently set up, then you could also get greater tax revenues from those buildings that you're building up with this taller than the ones we currently have, and that could also reduce the dependence on tax increases have going forward. So yeah, there, there, there are a number of ways that could be done, things that could be done to decrease the taxes uh, in the city of Durham. Thank you. Mr. Beasley? Well, um, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure how we would go about reducing our tax rate here in Durham, but I know we can uh, certainly expand our tax base. We can uh, be more um, friendly and in, in inviting uh, to, the, uh, to the developers coming into the area um, and encourage uh, more affordable uh, housing projects uh, here in Durham to expand our tax base. Um, so that's what we need to do. We need to um, clean the streets up, you know, make Durham a, a safer environment that would uh, encourage people to want to stay here in Durham. I think that's the main piece. We have to uh, encourage developers to want to come here and get Durham safe. That way we can expand our tax base. Thank you. Mr. Davis? Well, I don't know that we, can, we uh, ever get a real reduction in taxes. I think we, we can hold a line uh, and to make sure that the budgetary process mm -hmm. is one that uh, uh, is efficient and effective so that we don't have massive increases in taxes while we still give wonderful services uh, to our, our citizens. Um, I, I just don't think that there will be any large scale reduction in taxes, but we can indeed make sure that we are business friendly and that we do everything we can to expand the tax base and to make sure that we get more entrepreneurship in many other areas of Durham um, where we may have deserts where there are not very many businesses that are going on. Thank you. Ms. Carriker. As county commissioner, um, I we worked together to pass a budget that actually lowered taxes. It was very little, but we did actually pass a budget that lowered taxes. I'm, I'm very interested in making sure that we are running government as efficiently as possible. But having said that, with things that are going on in Washington and with things that are going on in, this, in Raleigh, it's more and more difficult for cities to run the government in a way that they can lower taxes a lot. However, extend, expanding our tax base is very, very crucial for this, that we get more people moving to Durham in all socioeconomic levels. We need housing for the businesses that we're bringing in, for their, the corporate heads that they will not move to Cary or Raleigh or Chapel Hill, that they will move to Durham. We need housing for them. We need more affordable housing so that all these lacks that I'm talking about, they become taxpayers. Thank you. Mr. Moffat? So the, it's money in, money out. It's revenues versus services. So we can shift revenues to other sources. Um, property, ta uh, excuse me, we can lower the property tax by shifting to sales tax, for example. Um, this year, while the county had a substantial tax increase, the city, we held the line and did not have a tax increase. But we did cut services like warrant control and look at the fallout from that. And that's the, that's the thing, is that um, to, to hold taxes or to reduce taxes means a reduction in services. Now, when we talk about increasing the tax base, it's really important to focus on the commercial because residential actually costs us more in services. 
then, it de then we get in tax revenue from it. But when we develop in commercial, commercial development, that's when our revenues off of the taxes are actually less than the services we have to put into it. Um, our goal is to have safe, affordable, and sustainable neighborhoods across the city so that the entire city is that way. And that's what I'm working on in council. Thank you. And, and answer to your question, yes, it's possible to reduce taxes. All the city council has to do is decide the tax rate is going to be something different. One cent brings in about $2.2 .2 million. We can decide that we don't want to provide $2.2 .2 million worth of services wherever, and we can reduce the taxes. So, yes, to answer your question, yes, you can do it, but at what cost? Uh, I, I would also say that uh, people are coming to Durham. Durham is now the fourth largest city in the state of North Carolina behind Charlotte, Raleigh, and Greensboro. And People, and we've grown not by annexation, we've grown because people are coming here. So to say that people don't want to come to Durham, that's, that's a false, that people are coming to Durham. But uh, we can reduce the property tax, but we're also going to have to fight either we reduce services or we shift the, the burden somewhere else. And the three largest incomes for running the city of Durham are property tax, sales tax, and service and fees. We can't raise sales tax unless we go to the General Assembly to get authority to do that. But we can reduce the property tax, we can increase service fees, or we can do less. Thank you. Uh, we've reached the end of the time that we've allowed for, for questions. Um, now each candidate will be given the opportunity to make a one-minute closing statement beginning with the last candidate on the right, and so that would be Mr. Moffitt. Thank you. Uh, what you know from my first term on council is that I work hard, I care deeply, I prepare thoroughly. I work across all parts of the city, and I have the support of community uh, community advocates in North, South, East, and West Durham. Um, early vote, it starts on Thursday. Uh, I ask for your support. The election is November 5th. Please pass the word. I have a website at donmoffitt.us. I have information outside on the table, and there's buttons and bumper stickers to show your support. So um, I thank everybody for coming out tonight. I thank you for your time and attention. I think there's some clear choices to be made, and I look forward to serving you for another four years. Thank you. Ms. Carricker? I, too, appreciate you coming tonight, and I appreciate the folks that are listening on television tonight. As Mr. Moffitt, I was appointed to serve as the county commissioner for 14 months, and but I really want to be on the city council. I think I can, I have the ability, the experience, the relationships that I can draw people from across all the city, all different types of, all different types of people from our diverse city to work together to make Durham a better place. My website is www.pamcarriker.com. I would appreciate your vote. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Davis. Thank you again to the League of Women Voters and the um, Inner Neighborhood Council. And let me just say one thing that since the last forum, we lost a giant. Uh, Ruth Mary Meyer uh, passed on, and uh, she was a wonderful statewide president of the League of Women Voters. Uh, and I really would like to do everything I can to honor her legacy. I also want to make sure that uh, we, I thank the people who voted in the primary who had the confidence in me and um, I really was pleased that it was a um, bridge to all of the different segments of Durham. I was very pleased to be able to uh, reach out to people across racial, ethnic, um, socioeconomic, um, sexual orientation, other kinds of barriers that often bring people, um, put, push people apart. I want to make sure that I continue to do that, and as a member of the city council, I will work hard to build coalitions to all people. Thank you. Mr. Beasley. Yes, sir. Excuse me. Um, first of all, I want to thank everyone who showed up tonight and everybody who tuned in. Um, we talked a lot about crime tonight. Uh, for, those that, for those of you that know me, crime is something that I'm, that I'm passionate about and I know. Um, I'm the candidate that's better prepared to deal with this issue. My 20 plus years as a bail bondsman in this community has uh, blessed me with the opportunity to establish relationships with judges, attorneys, DAs, law enforcement, as well as the alleged out here in the community. Um, those those uh, contacts have allowed me to uh, put a finger and identify the issues that, that we have here in Durham. Um, 
and, and come, out, come up with um, new approaches and strategic solutions for those issues. Um, there, there's, a, there's another uh, issue that, that, I, that I look at is um, the diversity of this board. Um, it, it's, it's shaped up pretty well with um, men, women, black and white, but the youth has no representation on here. So I'm asking that you all would consider me as your candidate for War II. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Williams? Uh, thank you for the uh, invitation to be here tonight. Uh, one of the things I'd like to say is that one thing that, for those who do know me, you know that I'm very vocal about things that I'm, I have a passion for. And one thing that you will have in me is, man, the city of Durham, someone who will represent your interests. I believe that every citizen should be counted. Every citizen should have a voice. And never believe or think that you come to the mayor of the city of Durham and you'll be talked down to. But it'll be an open platform for you to share your concerns what you think and what you feel about the city of Durham. That's one thing that I offer, that's one thing that I bring, that's one thing that I hope that you will vote for me for because I think that Durham can do so much better with Sylvester Williams as mayor. <clears throat> thank you. Mr. Bell? Uh, I would add my uh, thank you to the League and the Neighborhood Council for sponsoring this and certainly all of you taking the time to be here uh, to listen to the questions that have been posed. Uh, I, I would only say I, I take the role of mayor very seriously. Uh, I enjoy the role. I think you can look at my track record as a leader, uh, both at the county level and at the city level. I think if you look at Ox City, uh, where it is now versus where it was 10 or 12 years ago, it's much improved. And I'm not saying it's all due to the mayor of Durham making that happen, but uh, I've certainly played a part in some of the things, positive things that have happened in this community. And I would certainly appreciate your support to allow me to continue as the mayor of the city of Durham, North Carolina. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank all of the candidates for coming out tonight. I'd like to thank the audience for coming out tonight. I would like to remind you, as Mr. Moffat has already reminded you, but it's in my script, so I'll go ahead and read it, that early voting begins October 17th, and the general election will be on Tuesday, November 5th. Um, this forum will be rebroadcast on Durham's own television, DTV uh, 8 on Time Warner Cable. Um, it'll be rebroadcast numerous times over the next couple of weeks, and it'll also be on YouTube. So go look at it. Thank you. <laughs>